this is a globe of Pluto. Something, some, it is kind of small. Well, you know, it's a dwarf planet. <laughs> uh, we couldn't have done this just three years ago. Three years ago, this would have been more like that. That's what we knew Pluto to be like. And what has happened in the, in the subsequent, in the three years, in the last three years, has been historic and revolutionary. But Pluto's story didn't begin when the New Horizons spacecraft went by. It began almost a century ago. And so that's the story we're going to tell tonight. But first, let me give you a little grounding about me and about where we're going. I live here in Chelmsford. I've lived here since 1985. And um, as a profession, I write about astronomy for a magazine called Sky and Telescope. And I've been doing that since the 1970s. And my specialty is the solar system. If it doesn't circle the sun, don't ask me. <laughs> Stars, black holes, string theory, yeah, we have other people that do that. So my specialty is the solar system. So let's get a little grounding here. Um, this is the uh, edge of the sun for scale over here. Uh, the four inner planets, the four big outer planets, and Pluto's right here. The point is here that we have all of these planets formed at the same time from the same cloud of interstellar matter that led to the formation of the sun and, and all the planets. And yet, it's such an extraordinarily different set of objects. We've got little rocky ones and we've got big gassy ones. Big gassy ones are, uh, at least Jupiter and Saturn, are mostly made of hydrogen. And actually, going forward, if you ever take an astronomy class and the, and the prof asks you a question, you have no clue what the answer is. If you answer hydrogen, you have a pretty good chance of being right, because that's mostly what the universe is made of. Jupiter, by the way, is getting close to being in our evening sky. Uh, it's nearing what's called opposition. In about a month, it will be rising in the east when the sun sets in the west. It will be very bright and very obvious or if you're up late, even late tonight because the sky is clear, look in the east and you'll see it. Uranus and Neptune don't have so much hydrogen. They, are, they do have hydrogen in their outer envelopes, but um, uh, they're mostly made of, of other gases. The thing about these is they, they have no solid surface, right? If you jumped into Jupiter as you pass by in a spaceship, you would just keep diving down and down and down and never actually hit anything until the pressure and the temperature killed you, right? And you got squished. It's not the same as the planets that we're more familiar with, the ones that are close to the sun. And these are cutaways that kind of uh, represent what the interiors are. Mars is very interesting. Mars is going to be very big and bright later this summer. You'll hear a lot about Mars around July. I guarantee it. And, you, you, and even before then, the first week of May, NASA is launching a spacecraft to Mars. Uh, called Insight. That's another talk for another time. So if you take these really different bodies and you kind of break them down, I've used colors here to kind of represent the cr crudely what they're composed of. Rock, by rock I mean anything that's really solid. Metal, rock counts. Ice is not just water ice, but it's anything that can freeze easily, like carbon dioxide, you know, dry ice. Uh, ammonia can freeze, nitrogen can freeze. And then gases, when I'm talking about gases, I'm mostly talking about... <laughs> Very good, you're paying attention, that's great. Okay, hydrogen. Okay, and then in addition to the main plants, the major plants, we have all these smaller objects. A couple things to note. We have two moons in our solar system, Ganymede and Titan, that are actually bigger than the planet Mercury. We have a whole bunch of moons that are comparable in size to our moon. And here's Pluto down here. So there's this great range of medium-sized bodies. Now the interesting thing is that Pluto's story begins way, way back in the 1700s when a, a, a man named uh, uh, Titius uh, actually, he copied something that was, that was uh, from another scientist named Bode, and Titius was, 
was the one who came up with the idea and Bode published it. There was a simple relationship that seemed to match where the planets are spaced from the sun. And this is the relationship up here. All right, so if Earth is 1, you take 4 plus 6 is 10, divide by 10, that's 1. That's 1 Earth distance, what we call an astronomical unit. If you take Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn, and you, and you plug in these numbers, you get to a very close approximation how far they are from the sun. There was a problem with this, however. There should have been, according to this, a planet in between Mars and Jupiter. And none had been discovered. And so the astronomers of the day, most of them came from, uh, were in Europe, created something called the Celestial Police. I am not making this up. They called themselves the Celestial Police. These two gentlemen were the, uh, well, uh, 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 Franz von Zach was the ringleader. He organized it. And it was Giuseppe Piazzi who, on um, New Year's Day in 1801, after a dedicated search looking for this missing planet, discovered something between Mars and Jupiter going around the sun that came to be called Ceres. And in this painting, he's kind of pointing toward it. And in very short order, in the early 1800s, three more of these objects were, were discovered, right? Here's Mars, here's Jupiter, Vesta, Juno, Ceres, and Pallas. And in those days, they were considered planets. They even got their own little planet symbol. They would be included in tables of the planets. There they are highlighted, the big four. As it turns out, these first four objects are the four biggest objects in what we now know to be the asteroid belt. And in very short order, a couple of decades later, we started discovering asteroids by the dozens and hundreds. And we abandoned the notion that these four objects were planets in, in, a, in a major sense. And they came to be called minor planets. And this will come in handy later on. This is, we've seen a bunch of asteroids up close. This is what some of them look like. This spacecraft have flown by. In a couple of cases, like on Eros, we've landed on them. There's a little tiny dot down here called Itakawa. That's where a spacecraft, uh, uh, an asteroid that a Japanese spacecraft landed on, grabbed a little bit of, and came back to Earth. We have a spacecraft on its way now, a NASA spacecraft to a, an asteroid, its job will be to grab a sample and return it to Earth for study. Here's the biggest asteroid, the one that Piazzi discovered, called Ceres. We've had a spacecraft in orbit around Ceres called Dawn for some time now, and it looks an awful lot like the moon, right? A lot of craters. Not a lot of geology besides craters. There's another given for you. If somebody asks you, what is the dominant geologic process in the solar system, it is cratering. Craters on everything, except Jupiter and Saturn, because they don't have any surfaces. OK, that's, that's your sort of background for where we're going. Now, the story of Pluto began, actually, back in the 1860s, when John Herschel posited that there must be, by then, uh, the planet uh, Neptune had been discovered. There must be uh, planets beyond Neptune. Just if we keep discovering, you know, the, the, the planets out through Saturn were known to ancients. Those are the ones that you can see with your unaided eye on a starry night. Planet is from the Greek word meaning to wander. And they came to be known as bright objects that kind of drifted among the fixed stars. They're wanderers. Uranus was discovered, uh, it's the first planet actually discovered by a person. Uh, that was William Herschel, John's uh, son. And after that, there was another planet discovered that was Neptune. Now, Neptune's discovery uh, what was an interesting one. That's a, a, a story in its own right. Neptune was discovered because as astronomers followed Uranus around the sun, it didn't move quite the way that mathematically it should have. They didn't follow the prediction. And the deduction was that there must be another planet out beyond Uranus that was af affecting it and, and tugging on it with its gravity. And so a search was put on by two teams of astronomers, and, uh, uh, and Neptune was discovered very quickly. It's actually a very large and easy to spot planet. 
after Neptune was discovered, they went back to Uranus and said, okay, does this explain everything going on with Uranus? And they said, no, there's still a little something going on. There must be yet another planet out beyond Neptune that we haven't found yet. And so Percival Lowell, who's from the Boston area, self-made astronomer, very rich guy, you know, Lowell, the Lowells, right? Um, he went to Arizona, built himself an observatory, and one of the things he wanted to do was to find this planet X that he had predicted. And uh, another guy, William Pickering, had also predicted that there would be a planet X out beyond Neptune. They did the mathematical calculations to try to estimate where it would be and how big it should be. Okay, so the problem is that poor, poor uh, Percival Lowell died in 1916. His observatory was built uh, he had been spending a lot of time with Mars. This planet X was kind of on the back burner. But after his death, the astronomers that were left behind really kicked the, this notion of discovering Pluto into high gear. And so they hired a young boy from Kansas named Clyde Tombaugh. He was only in his 20s. He, he had uh, built his own telescope from, I, I don't know if you can see there, but there are some pretty crude looking parts here. Uh, tractor parts, he grew up on a farm. Being an astronomer was not in his dad's plan for his son. Right? He wanted him to take over the farm. But in any case, Tombaugh took very care of, he was a very methodical, careful observer of the sky and especially the planets. And he made sketches of Jupiter and Mars and Saturn. He sent them to Lowell Observatory. The, obs uh, the astronomers there were impressed. They needed somebody to conduct the search for Pluto. So they got Tombaugh to come out to leave his home, leave the farm behind, leave college, go out to uh, Lowell Observatory, which is in Flagstaff, Arizona, and begin the hunt for Planet X, for, per uh, for Percival Lowell's Planet X. This was the telescope that he used, the, the Pluto telescope. And what's, what's going on is back here, this black thing at the back end, this is not the kind of telescope where you use an eyepiece. It had these big photographic plates, about this big, that were slapped in the back here. And so Tombaugh's job was to try to find Planet X by its motion against the stars. The, plan the stars would stay put, and Pluto, if it were out there, would be moving among the stars a little bit each night. So his job was to take a picture of an area of the sky, and then a couple of nights later go back and take a picture of the same area of sky, and then, oops, Oh, no. Well, that's not good. I'm a very animated speaker. And the idea is that he would compare the two photographs. Oh, I don't think this is going to work because there's a spring missing. Oh, well, I'll just have to do it by hand. No problem. No, no, it's okay. It's all right. We can, we can continue. So... Here's this 22-year-old farm boy. Guess what? Flagstaff's very cold. That's, that's when he arrived, in the middle of winter. And his job was to take these photographs all night, develop them, and then compare them with each other to see if anything has moved. Now, you can imagine these big photographic plates full of stars. How are you supposed to figure out the one that's moved? Well, they had developed something called a blink comparator, which is what this thing is would actually put two of these photographs side by side, and there was a little gizmo in the center. I can't even use the laser now, can I? Let's see if it'll work without it. No. Nope. I'll just point. Do you, wanna, do you want a laser? Oh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Just in time. I want it back. Uh, ooh, it's a purple. <laughs> ooh, it's a purple laser. Whoa. <laughs> All right, so he would mount these two things, and then he'd look in this eyepiece, and a little mirror would flip back and forth, right? And he could compare very quickly areas of the sky. And so one day, he's flipping, and he saw that there was an object that was moving. It's in this picture. This is the, one of the discovery images of the planet Pluto. Can you see it? Yeah? Oh, by the way, it's not, the, it's not this thing here. That's not it. It's that, right there, right? Can you imagine picking that out in the background, just going, kind of going like this against the stars? So 
Tom Ball walked into his boss's office, who's a, whose name was Dr. Vesto Slifer, and he said, Dr. Slifer, I have found your Planet X. And in fact, he had. He became very famous. Lowell Observatory became, is the first uh, planet ever discovered by an American. And uh, the, the, Lowell, the Lowell astronomers were very cagey. They didn't call it a planet. They said, we have found an object circling the sun out beyond Neptune, right? And uh, the name, many things were suggested for the name. Lowell was one of them, right, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, and it wasn't like they had a contest, but it turns out uh, an 11-year-old girl in England named Venetia Burney uh, was reading about the discovery of this object, and she told her dad, well, they should name it Pluto, because Pluto is the god of the underworld, and it's the most distant thing, and this is on the doorstep to, like, you know, nothingness. So they should name it Pluto. Well, her, her father knew the royal astronomer who sent a telegram to Lowell Observatory, and they liked it very much. Not only because of the mythological connection, but the first two letters of Pluto are P-L, which match Percival Lowell. So there was a real, so, and so it became that, that uh, Pluto was, uh, became. Now, Here's your tidbit for the night. Clyde Tombaugh visited Chelmsford. He slept here. He slept in my guest bedroom on the night of September 23rd, 1987. He was on a uh, speaking tour across country. I, I knew him pretty well. And uh, he, need, he and his wife, Patsy, needed a place to stay, so they stayed with us. There you go. <laughs> Chelmsford's claim to fame. All right, so all we knew about Pluto was it was this little faint star-like spot floating out beyond Neptune that was circling around the sun. That's all we could do was study its light. We, we, even with the most powerful telescopes, we couldn't resolve its surface. We couldn't see a ball. We couldn't see any detail. But we could measure how much light total was coming from Pluto. It's reflecting sunlight, right? So if it was really big, it would be brighter, and if it was really small, it would be dimmer. Remember, they were looking for something big enough to affect the orbit of Uranus. Well, therein lies the tale. First thing that was discovered was in 1955, astronomers realized that Pluto did not stay the same brightness all the time. Sometimes it was brighter, sometimes it was fainter, and this variation uh, repeated every 6.4 days, and it meant that Pluto was rotating with that period. Right? If you think about the Earth, right? if, you were to, if you could study the Earth from so far away that all you could see was a point of light, as it spun, right, when Asia was in view, it would be a little bit brighter, and when the Pacific Ocean was in view, it would be a little bit dimmer. And that's how they discovered the rotation rate. Now, they did know about Pluto's orbit, and they knew that its orbit was not circular. It had a on a lopsided orbit that brought it farther or closer to the sun, and when it was closest to the sun, astronomers realized, it was actually closer than Neptune. Here's another factoid. Remember, there will be a test. From, 19, from 1979 until 1999, Pluto was closer to the sun than Neptune. It was not the most distant object. So how come they don't collide? Well. In 1965, astronomers discovered that they're in a kind of resonance. <clears throat> here's, here's Pluto's orbit, this uh, orange one, and here's Neptune's. It turns out that Pluto's orbit is both eccentric and highly tipped. Its plane is highly tipped to the sun. And Pluto and Neptune are in a resonance. Neptune goes around the sun exactly three times in the time it takes Pluto to go around twice. Pluto takes about 250 years to go around the sun. It has not nearly gone around the sun yet since it was discovered. And because of that resonance, the two planets can never collide, ever. They're kind of locked in that dance. <coughs> so as I said, all we knew about Pluto was that it was this little faint telescopic dot. So how big was it? How big was it? Well, it depends. If it were really small and has a bright surface, it would appear as bright as if it were really big and had a dark surface. And we didn't know which of those possibilities it was. All we knew was how much sunlight it was reflecting in, in total back to Earth. That changed in 1976 <clears throat> when astronomers discovered that spectroscopically 
uh, they, they saw a fingerprint, a spectral fingerprint of frozen methane on the surface of Pluto. Frozen methane, what color do you think that is? Do you think it's bright or dark? It's bright like ice. And so Pluto must be more like this than this, which is really bad news because, again, we're looking for a big planet to perturb Uranus. Well, guess what? By this point, astronomers realized that there was nothing wrong with the orbit of Uranus, that the mathematics completely were explained by Neptune alone. So, incredibly, incredibly, Percival Lowell made a prediction for where Pluto should be in the sky based on the assumption that it was this big, massive thing. He set in motion the process by which Clyde Tombaugh discovered it very close to where the prediction was, and it was just damn fool luck. Completely serendipitous that Pluto ended up where the prediction was because it didn't have the mass to affect Uranus at all. It was just coincidence. So here's the spectrum. It's in the infrared that shows the big dips, the absorptions. The CH4 is methane right here. This is, this is how they knew that methane ice covered Pluto. <clears throat> so, all right, so it's small and it's bright. Maybe it's a frost-covered cannonball, giant iron ball, right? Well, we don't know what the mass is, but then in 1978, a moon was discovered around Pluto, and here's what the discovery image of Pluto and its moon looked like. And uh, it's a long story, but, but uh, uh, the U.S. Naval Observatory took a series of images of Pluto in support of the Voyager mission, which had nothing to do with Pluto, but they took the pictures anyway. And some nights this little bump was over here, and some nights it was over here. Remember, Pluto rotates every 6.4 days. <clears throat> and so astronomers said, wow, it means that Pluto must have a, a moon around it. And here's the guy and, uh, who discovered it, James Christie. This is his wife, Charlene. Here's where you'll impress your friends at the next party. It came to be called Charon. Now, Pluto is the god of the underworld, right? And Charon, anybody know who Charon is? Who, who knows? Kratos? Charon. Yeah, I'm sorry? OK. So Charon was the ferryman, right, to the underworld. And so. Christie discovered this object, and he, he had just been married to Charlene. And he said, I'm going to name it after you, Char. That's what he called her Char for short. And so he f soon realized that it had to have a mythological connection. He just couldn't name it after anybody. So in a sweat, he woke up. He just moved into a new house. He went running, running to a box full of his mythology books. He's flipping wildly through the pages. And he, lo and behold, he came across uh, one of these gods of the underworld, Charon, right? But in Greek, the proper pronunciation is Charon. And so he was able to name it after his wife, Charlene, by taking the first four letters and, and adopting Charon. So if somebody says to you, how do you pronounce that? You can say, well, if you're true to the Greek, it's Charon. But because of James Christie's wife, Charlene, everyone knows that it's Charon. He actually got to name it after his wife. That's a picture of them I took uh, a few years ago. Well, they're locked in this kind of dance because Charon turns out to be pretty large compared to Pluto. So they're orbiting each other just like the Earth and Moon are orbiting each other. And the center of gravity of the system is there, actually outside of Pluto. Now, in the case of the Earth-Moon system, we're actually orbiting, we, the Earth, are orbiting around the center of the Earth-Moon system center of gravity, but that turns out to be inside the Earth, so you don't really notice it. For all intents and purposes, the Moon goes around us, and, and that's, that's, we don't notice that uh, juggling. I'm actually going to skip this. This was a, a thing uh, where we were able to watch Pluto go in front of and behind, uh, Sharon go in front of and behind Pluto, and it helped us determine its sizes. Long story short, when Pluto was first hypothesized, we thought it might be, this is a log scale, this is masses times the Earth, at least 10 times the mass of the Earth. And then, bit by bit, 
it got whittled away. Here was Pluto's discovery. By the time methane was detected and Charon, Charon's discovery allowed us to compute the mass of Pluto. And it turns out that Pluto's mass is only about 1 500th that of the Earth. It is. We've known for a long time that Pluto is tiny and not very massive. OK. So, but we were content to call it a planet. You know, it, it was a fairly big object that circled the sun. And then something happened in 1988 that started to change the landscape. An object was discovered even farther out than Pluto that uh, proved, oh, I'm sorry, this is a discovery of Pluto. Yes, Pluto has an, uh, an atmosphere. I'm going to skip that. Uh, uh, I'm a little ahead of myself. Using the Hubble Space Telescope, we were able to see that there were spots on Pluto uh, and that those spots uh, were, were actually distributed around it. There's a color view. Um, you can see the scale here. It's about you know, 1,200 miles across. It's not that big. But over time, the spots change. And this is telling us that there are seasons on Pluto, that those spots are not continents and oceans, but they're like ice deposits or snow deposits that are moving around with seasons. These are two different photos taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. One was taken in 2002 and the other in 1994. And things are shifting around on Pluto. OK, this is what I was talking about. Another object was discovered out where Pluto is. It wasn't alone. And it turns out there are lots and lots of these objects out around Pluto and beyond. We call them collectively trans-Neptunian objects. Remember the story of the asteroids, right? They, were, they started out as planets, and then they became kind of just run-of-the-mill small bodies. This is when the argument started that maybe Pluto shouldn't be called a planet. It goes back to 1992. Astronomers debated it long and hard. There's this, our, in, in our notion of how the solar system formed, there's a belt of these objects, which are called the Kuiper belt. Billions of objects, maybe a trillion objects, all, all in that area of the solar system. Here's Pluto's orbit for scale. Pluto just happens to be a really big example of an object in the Kuiper belt. So the question is, if it's just one of thousands of objects, why should it be a planet? Here's a picture that was a, a, a plot of all the objects in that uh, Kuiper belt. This is the orbit of Neptune for scale. There's this, uh, Uranus, uh, Saturn, Jupiter's orbit. The sun is that little star there. Earth just doesn't even show at this scale. Here's Pluto. Here's all the other objects in that area. All the white ones, by the way, are also objects that are in this 3 to 2 resonance with Neptune. Pluto was not alone. It was not special. It wasn't even particularly big. So why should it be a planet? There it is. There's a, it's, it's way smaller than our own moon. So doubts began to be raised as to whether or not Pluto was a planet. <laughs> Astronomers starting to argue. By the way, this Dave Granlund, he does um, illustrations for the, the wicked local newspaper chain. So this appeared in the Chelmsford Independent long ago. And, uh, and the astronomers actually, it's kind of funny, right? Because here's, here's, uh, here's uh, Goofy, right? Well, actually, Goofy is a Warner Brothers character. He's not a, a Disney character. The Warner Brothers, that's, that's um, Pluto is the dog, right? Now, Pluto was discovered in 1930. Pluto, the character, first appeared in a Disney cartoon in 1930. Ah, Walt Disney must have named Pluto the dog after Pluto the planet. And I contacted Disney and their archivist. They have no record that that's what happened, but it stands to reason, right? Pluto the dog, so. OK, now, the, the guy who most hated the notion of Pluto being a planet was this guy here, Brian Marsden. He worked at the Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge. He was sort of the gatekeeper of discoveries in the solar system. And in his mind, Pluto should just be another asteroid, just one of those objects out in the Kuiper belt, just a number, and it's really nothing special. Well, this is Tombaugh when he came to visit, right? Tombaugh gave a talk at Harvard, which is where Brian Marsden worked. They met amicably. I took this picture, right? Notice Tombaugh's death grip here on, on Marsden's hand. I'll get even with you for demoting Pluto. All right, so, so the debate kind of abated. And then in 2005, really everything changed because an object was discovered in the Kuiper belt that seemed to be bigger 
than Pluto. It was called, name came to be called Eris. Now here's the thing, uh, professional astronomers have this sort of uh, union called the International Astronomical Union. All the world's professional astronomers belong to it. And so they had a decision to make. If it were just another, if, if you wanted this discovery, right, Eris, if it were like just a small object, it would go to this committee for naming. And if it were really a planet, it would go to this committee for, for naming. So they literally had to decide whether it was a planet or not before they could name it. And so there began the debate, the great debate, over whether or not Pluto was truly a planet. Here's Pluto with its moons. Here's Eris. It turns out that Eris is just a little bit smaller than Pluto, but we didn't know that then. And so in 2006, the astronomers got together. There was a, there was a resolution on the, on the agenda to define what a planet is. This was held in Europe, and the Europeans didn't much like the Americans and their sort of highfalutin ways because it was America's planet, right? It was discovered at Lowell Observatory. The European astronomers tend to be more dynamicists. They're more concerned about the orbits and interactions and less about the actual bodies. So they took a vote. They took a vote uh, on the definition of a planet. There were lectures about what, what constitutes a planet. Is it a big tent kind of thing? This is the actual vote. In order to vote, you had to have a yellow card. That meant that you were an official member. And guess what? They have voted to approve the definition of what a planet is. And here's that definition. It's a stupid definition. Stupid. That's with two O's. Stupid, right? They decided that a planet, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, a planet is a celestial body that is in orbit around the sun. Well, guess what? We have discovered thousands of objects in orbits around other stars. I guess they're not planets because they don't orbit the sun, right? It's an object that has enough mass to be round. Now, what does that mean? Um, think of a snowball, right? You can make a snowball pretty much any shape you want right, because the material strength of the ice and the snow is greater than the tendency of gravity to pull it into a droplet, a big droplet. But there comes a point, if you make an object big enough, it's a couple of hundred miles across, the gravitational energy exceeds the material strength of the object. So it doesn't matter what it's made of, if you have something that's a big irregular object, 300 miles across, it's gradually going to turn into the shape of a big round drop. That's called hydrostatic equilibrium. So it has enough mass to be round. That's OK. But then it says it has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. What the heck does that mean? It has to do with how much mass it has. Okay. The best uh, analogy I've ever come up with for this is uh, most of you remember your school days and how there was a bully in the school that you wanted to avoid, right? And the bully goes swaggering across the playground. And you don't exactly run up to him and say, hey, hi, how are you today? You get out of town, right? You stay as far away from the bully as you can. That's what clearing the neighborhood means in a gravitational sense. It means that if you're a big object and some smaller object comes by you, it's going to get flung gravitationally out into Timbuktu. So that's what both of these things has enough mass to be round and has cleared the neighborhood around it, so both have to do with mass. The problem is when you discover something that's far away, you don't really know how massive it is. And so by that definition, Pluto didn't qualify to be a planet because even though it had enough mass to be round, it did not have enough mass to clear its orbit of other things in its neighborhood. Right? So, here are the two largest asteroids, Ceres and Vesta. Which one is round? Ceres or Vesta? Ceres. Ceres. So that's one for, for Ceres. Vesta would not qualify based on roundness, right? So Vesta, Ceres is actually considered a dwarf planet. Vesta is not. Is this a planet? Is it round? OK. Does it circle the sun? Yes. Does it have enough mass to clear its neighborhood? Yes, but. Yes, but. Well, that's right, because the moon's actually in orbit. But if something comes by here, the Earth is essentially cleared away other stuff anywhere near it in its orbit around the sun. But if you take the Earth 
and you take it way away from the sun out into the Kuiper belt where it's still circling the sun, it no longer, because then the distances get really large and it no longer has enough mass to clear its orbit. So Earth qualifies here, but it wouldn't qualify farther out in the solar system. So as I said, it's a really stupid definition because it defined the small end of what's the planet and never bothered to define the big end. They didn't ask me. Why? Well, you came here to find out about our, what we've learned about Pluto. And now our story jumps forward to uh, just uh, not that long ago. The New Horizons spacecraft was launched in 2006. It attained, a, thanks to its rocket, a very rapid velocity. Pluto, on average, is about 40 times farther from the sun than the Earth is. Ordinarily, it would take a very long time for a rocket to get there. But thanks to a very powerful launch rocket, it only took nine years, which was really, really fast. Here's its, its route. It also got a, a boost in energy by flying, flying close to Jupiter uh, in early 2007. And the, this oval here, this is Pluto's orbit. And this point here is where, they, where, where New Horizons went by. So here was its launch from Florida. My wife Cheryl and I went down to see the launch. They, they postponed it two days. We couldn't stick around. We had to come back, and they launched it two days after we left. Oh, well. Uh, it went past Jupiter, it took some pictures of Jupiter, got that gravity boost. Uh, one of Jupiter's moons is called Io. It's actually a big, uh, highly volcanic moon. You can see the, this is a, a volcano erupting on the surface of Io as New Horizons was going by. So here we are, we're getting close. And you know about Charon, the moon Charon that Pluto had. Well, just before it was launched, astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope discovered two more moons. Nix and Hydra in orbit around Pluto. This is great because now you can take pictures of Pluto and Charon and Nix and Hydra. You get four bodies for the price of one mission, which is great. However, after New Horizons was launched, astronomers discovered two more moons, which came to be called Kerberos, which was the dog of, the, of, uh, of, of Charon, the dog of the underworld, and Hydra. And the pro, the pro, I'm sorry, sticks. Sorry, thank you. And the problem was that, that, and here's Sharon and Pluto. This is a Hubble image. The problem is that they were going to go through the system. Uh, I, I left to stop out. Instead of orbiting, the moons don't go around Pluto like this, like ours does around us. They go around like this, right? So from the standpoint of the spacecraft approaching, all those moons look like a big bullseye. And you're going through the system. And they were worried that there might be dust. If, oh, all right, we've discovered the moon. Suppose there's a ring. Suppose we're slamming through this system at like 10 miles a second, and we run into a ring particle, which tears a big hole in our gas tank or our antenna or whatever it might be. So there was a lot of worry about that. It turned out to be ill-founded. This is the path of the spacecraft. It was going through very fast. They only had a few hours to take pictures. Here's the spacecraft. It had a series of, uh, of experiments on board. Two of them were named Ralph and Alice. Does that mean anything to anybody? Yes, they really were named for Ralph, that Ralph and that Alice from the Honeymooners. And by this point, poor Clyde Tombaugh had died. He died in the late 1990s, uh, 1997. And with the permission of his family, his wife, his widow Patsy was still alive, they took some of his uh, cremated remains and put them in a little canister on the spacecraft. So a little bit of Clyde, having been to Chelmsford, uh, went past Pluto. Uh, and so this is what Pluto looks like from Earth, from the very best Hubble Space Telescope image. Not very much to look at. So I'm going to show you a quick series of images from the New Horizons spacecraft as it was approaching, uh, as it was approaching Pluto. This was now 2014. This is uh, one year before, Le before getting there. You can already see Pluto and Charon. Here's January, six months to go. You can see Pluto wobbling, right? It's going around that center of mass. It's kind of like dancing uh, with a partner, swinging each other around. Now we're just uh, three months to go. We're starting to see some detail on Pluto itself. And now we have just three weeks to go Boy, it's starting to look really tantalizing. I want you to notice that Pluto is bright, has a patchy mottled surface, and uh, is slightly orangish. By comparison, Charon 
is also kind of patchy, looks a little, but it's gray. And we knew before we got there that Pluto was covered with hydrocarbons, things like uh, tars and that kind of stuff, and the frozen methane. And, and Charon was covered with water ice, but not, didn't have the hydrocarbons. All right, so here we are, we're approaching, here's Pluto down here, we're just hours away from going by them, and we can only, we can't stay. We're flying by so fast, we only have a few hours to take pictures. And what, what a remarkable place it turned out to be. Okay, this is, this is now just six days, uh, five days before the encounter, and uh, we're seeing all kinds of interesting features on the surface. Uh, there's a, a, something that looks like it could be a big crater. There's all kinds of interesting stuff. Remember now, here's the thing. Pluto, on the one hand, Pluto is spinning on its side, so we're really only looking at one hemisphere very well. On the other hand, it takes six and a half days to completely circle, to, to rotate, but we're going by in just a few hours. The upshot of that is we were not going to get to see the whole planet with any kind of detail, just one part of it. Okay, here we are. It's, it's encounter day, and I'm down at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, which was the control center, and here was the countdown. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, So at that moment in deep space, right, billions of miles from Earth, New Horizons is going by Pluto. And it took a while to get all that information back, but we now know a whole bunch about Pluto. This, br this bright area here was seen from, from very far away, and it's kind of a heart-shaped feature, right? It came to be called Tombaugh Reggio in honor of Clyde, right? Tombaugh Reggio, but one side, notice, you can already see one side is uh, a lot brighter and smoother. This is kind of rough. We'll get to know that a little bit better. It becomes more obvious when you, when you kind of stretch the contrast and the color here. Notice all this interesting stuff going on. I think you need new battery. Uh, we're getting kind of a weak one here. All right, Pluto is a solid object. And it's so far away from the sun that it should be completely frozen throughout. No matter what its whatever it make, its makeup is, it should be completely frozen. Um, if you have, right, if you have a glass of water and a one gallon jug of water and you stick them both in the freezer, which one is going to freeze solid first? The, the glass, right? The glass of water because it has a higher surface to volume ratio. And the same is true of Pluto because it's a relatively small object. It should be completely frozen solid. And yet, the models suggest that maybe deep down inside Pluto, there's still a layer of liquid water underneath this really thick ice cap. And we see evidence of that here. Now, um, the moon is covered with that famous geologic feature which is called craters, right? But not all the moon is cratered. Some areas are actually rather smooth. Those are called the maria. It's a Latin word meaning seas. And the way cratering works is let's assume that things get cratered at the same rate over billions of years. And you look at a surface like Pluto, and in some areas you see lots and lots of craters, and in some areas you see nothing. What does that tell you? It tells you that this area over here on the left must be very old because it's been exposed for a long time and it's had plenty of time to collect craters. Because Sputnik Planum, which is what this smooth area was came to call, has no craters on it at all. What does that mean? It means that it must be very a very young surface. It's like an etch-a-sketch, right? You can draw and draw and draw, and then, you know, if you shake it, it all goes away. If you have craters on a, a surface like the moon, and you flood it with something, in the moon's case it's, it's molten lava from about three billion years ago, it wipes out all the craters and you have to start counting all over again. The fact that there are no craters at all on that big white area to astronomers meant that the surface could be no more than about 10 million years old. Anybody in here 10 million years old? 
My wife thinks I am sometimes. 10 million years seems like a long time, but on the scale of the age of the solar system, four and a half billion years, 10 million years is just the blink of an eye. And in fact, it means that if it's only 10 million years old, whatever made that smooth is probably still happening today. It's probably still happening today. How can that be? How can Pluto have eruptions if it's supposed to be solid all the way through? Well, these are some of the close-ups that New Horizons took. It's got, it has mountains. These mountains, in this case, are made of water ice. The smooth areas are covered with nitrogen, frozen nitrogen, which if you get it cold enough, it will freeze, definitely freeze. These are some very interesting features in the mountains. Notice this is the edge of Sputnik Planum, that big white area. It's not exactly smooth. It looks like sand dunes or something on the surface. And there are these cracks in between these big chunks. Uh, this close-up shows that there's like looks like a glacier flowing down out of the mountains onto the plain. Look at these streamlines. Something is moving on Pluto. Now, here's another section. This is a corner. You can see there are flows. Here's a crater up here. Look at that little tongue of material that's gone into that. Um, there's a crater here somewhere that's half, I guess that's it, that's kind of half flooded. Something is happening on Pluto now to make, this to make this nitrogen ice flow. These polygons, these sort of irregularly shaped uh, segments on the surface, are telling astronomers that something is bubbling up from underneath. And I want you to think about a pot of boiling oatmeal on a stove. Okay? You get bubbles, and it creates, it's, there's a kind of scale to it, right? When it's slowly bubbling, the bubbles tend to appear in the same place. They tend to be all the same size. And that's what's happening on Pluto. Something is gurgling. There's enough heat inside Pluto to make this liquid, to make this uh, uh, nitrogen ice soft and kind of flow like plastic. No one expected this. No one expected anything like this on Pluto. We expected it to be just boring and cratered. And in fact, we see very few craters, and we see lots of interesting geology. Along the edge, the day night, the edge of the day night um, uh, boundary here, this is interesting detail. It looks like a snake skin. And uh, uh, it's, it's very hard to explain geologically. We don't have anything on Earth that looks like this. There turned out to be volcanoes. This doesn't look like much right here, but I think we've lost it. <laughs> Sorry, thanks so. though. Um, but let's, uh, let's zoom in on it. Right? Looking down the throat, 100 kilometers is about 60 miles across. It's pretty big. You can see there's a hole in the top. There's volcanoes. Turns out Pluto has, we knew it had an atmosphere, a very thin atmosphere. Turns out that atmosphere looks blue, just like it does on Earth. It's the same process. When you look up into a blue sky during the day, it looks blue because the sunlight, which is shining through it, you know, sunlight has all the colors in the rainbow, right? Red and yellow and green and all that. The atmospheric molecules, the oxygen and the nitrogen in our atmosphere, have the same, about the same size as a wavelength of blue light. Red light is actually a longer wavelength. It kind of passes through the atmosphere and doesn't really see or interact with the gas molecules. But the blue light, being a shorter wavelength, interacts with the atmosphere and scatters. And that scattered sunlight, only blue, is why our sky is blue, and it's why the sky of Pluto is blue, too. It's sunlight scattering through it. The atmosphere of Pluto has hazes in it, and the, that haze has different layers. Look at, the, look at the streaks up at the top. These are layers within the atmosphere of Pluto. No one expected this. No one expected this at all, the best minds. Now, it turns out, I was telling you that, that, that Pluto seems to be geologically active now. It apparently is, was the case that even though the atmosphere of Pluto is really vanishingly thin right now, it must have been thicker in the past. It must have been thick enough for fluid to be on its surface. How can I explain this? If Earth didn't have the thick atmosphere that it has right now, water could not be fluid on our surface. It would go directly from ice to gas, a process called sublimation. But because we have a dense atmosphere of a, of a certain temperature, water can be all three phases, solid, liquid, and gas. Okay? On Pluto, 
It's got too thin an atmosphere. The atmosphere right now is too thin to allow liquid on its surface. But the fact that we see puddles that look like filled ponds, it looks, it, look on this one on the left, it looks like there's like little stream networks there. Um, these are telling the astronomers that at some point, Pluto must have had a much thicker atmosphere that allowed liquid to flow on its surface in the fairly recent past. And this is a little bit complicated. Remember, Pluto is spinning on its side. Turns out that it goes through these really wild gyrations in its spin. Sometimes the pole is pointed closer to the sun, sometimes farther away. Uh, it's, a, it's a process that many of the planets go through, Mars especially, Earth not so much, thank goodness. Can you imagine if Earth's, if Earth's spin pole suddenly tipped over and it was the North Pole was pointed at the sun for a prolonged period of time? All the ice would melt, right? We'd have huge floods all over the place. That kind of dramatic change doesn't happen here on Earth, but it does happen on Pluto. And what it means is that there, when you run the calculations of how much sunlight Pluto is receiving over the long haul, there were times, 900,000 or a couple of million years ago, the scale on the side here is surface pressure, how dense the atmosphere is at the surface. On our planet, surface pressure is about 1,000 millibars. So at some point in Pluto's past, it must have had a surface pressure roughly one-tenth as much as the Earth. That's enough. That's enough to make that liquid possible on the surface. So that's just Pluto. We saw all the other objects in the system, too. We saw Charon up close. This is a close-up of Charon. It's got a couple of interesting features. Um, notice that crack that starts over on the right-hand edge and goes, I can't actually. <coughs> uh, this is where I need one of those old-school pointers, right? Um, anyway, there's a big crack that runs along its equator. There's this very enigmatic dark thing up at, up at its pole. Uh, Charon appears to be uh, to have had an in interesting past as well. Uh, in this case, it really is a dead place. There's nothing new going on in Charon. Uh, and, and the cracks and all this other stuff happened a very, very long time ago and has not happened since. I'm going to kind of fast forward. Here's a close-up of that crack. Um, Remember your glass of water in the, fri in the freezer, right? So is it going to freeze from the inside out or from the outside in? Outside in, right? And what happens to water when it freezes? It expands. So if you're freezing a glass of water or a bottle of soda that you lit, put in there to chill fast and you forgot about, right? A bottle of beer, right? Do you drink beer? She, you, do you allow him to drink beer? No, she says no. So as the outside has frozen, the inside continues to freeze and expand. What happens to the outside? Cracks. It cracks. And so that crack means that as Sharon was freezing from the outside in, the stuff on the inside expanded and created this giant chasm around it. It's a crack in its surface, several miles deep, uh, all the way around that shows that it, that it uh, kind of froze from the outside in. This is a little video showing some of the areas uh, on, on Sharon. I get my cursor out of the way there. There's that canyon, that crack that goes all the way around. Very interesting place. They have a moated mountain, which we'll get back to in a second. So astronomers are trying to come up with names for all these things. These are the names that they proposed. They ran a contest, a public contest suggest names for Pluto and Charon. In the case of Charon, they wanted to have um, uh, characters in science fiction, among others. Right, Captain Nemo down there at lower left. You, you have see a few characters from Star Trek, right? Uhura, Kirk, Sulu, <coughs> Spock. And uh, they propose these names informally and guess what? Remember that, that, that group, the International Astronomical Union, the one that demoted Pluto? Yeah, they didn't like these names. <laughs> Did not like them at all. There are a few there that could stand, like Clark Mons there was for Arthur C. Clarke, uh, famous, uh, famous science fiction writer. And so these names here, are these are now official. They were just announced like a week ago, just a week ago. So uh, if I had given this a month or ago, I couldn't have, I couldn't have shown you this. And a couple did uh, make the cut. Uh, Clark still got his. Uh, Kubrick from uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, right? Stanley Kubrick. Um, Dorothy 
is the Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz, right? And there will be more to come. This is just the first of, of many. Now, remember those four little moons? Well, we got to see them at various uh, resolutions, too. Uh, and, and some of them are kind of interesting. Mostly, they're just little chips of ice you know, orbit around Pluto. Not, not all that big. You can see the scale down there at the lower left. They're maybe 30, 40, 50 miles across at best. And uh, they have these interesting orbits. And all those numbers mean absolutely nothing to you, I think. The spin period uh, is, is how long it takes them to go around. But the numbers don't, aren't nearly as, as dramatic as just showing the video of them spinning as they go around Pluto. So here, the two inner ones, you see with the, the brown ones with the dots, that's Pluto and Charon. They're locked in, in, to face each other all the time. Their gravity is so strong, just like the moon is locked to face the Earth, right? They're, they're locked facing each other. <laughs> this one out here is just kind of spinning crazy. If you notice, if you notice, oh, well, it's too late. One of them is actually spinning backward. Let's see if I can get it to play again. Which one is spinning backward? This one here, right? It's spinning backward. Now that one's spinning right. It, uh, that one, uh, that one, that, that one. They're all, one of them is, yeah, it's that one up there, right? We had it right the first time. Okay, anyway, we, we are not going to learn any more about that system for a very, very, very long time. Back in the 1990s, after the Voyager 2 spacecraft had gone past the planet Neptune, we had now explored every planet in the solar system out through Neptune, the big eight, the eight major planets. And the US Postal Service issued a set of stamps. Back then, Pluto was still considered a planet. And this was what they put out for, for Pluto, not yet explored. Right? This was the one that we were still waiting to. This mission was just a dream in somebody's eye back then. And now, this is on, right? Now that stamp is obsolete. Pluto has been explored. The guy on the left is Alan Stern. He is the chief of the science team that, that led the New Horizons mission. These are other people uh, in, on his team. Uh, it's a very diverse group of folks. Uh, this is, a, so Pluto finally got its stamp uh, two years ago. Uh, there's Pluto and New Horizons. And, uh, and so it's, it has now been explored very completely. He's <laughs> Salon Stern with his, uh, with his uh, bumper sticker. An interesting historical footnote is that uh, the first pictures that we got of another planet from a spacecraft were taken by Mariner 4, a NASA spacecraft, in 1965, on July 14th, 1965. And the Photos that we got from Pluto, from the New Horizons spacecraft, were July 14th, 2015. Anybody want to do the math in your head of how many years that is between them? It's 50 years to the day. Isn't that an interesting coincidence? Our first, they're like bookends of planetary exploration, right? The first pictures of Mars and our first pictures of Pluto were 50 years apart to the day. Now, New Horizons mission is not over yet. It was sold to NASA as the exploration of Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, the, those, all those other objects. The problem was that when they launched it, they didn't know where they were going to go after Pluto. The, the next stop hadn't been discovered yet. And so it was a really quite an effort to discover an object that New Horizons could go visit. They, they finally resorted to the Hubble Space Telescope. This is the discovery object, the discovery images of the object uh, that New Horizons is going to. It's just a little blip, and, and we don't know anything really about it, except that last summer, this little object, this previously unknown object, drifting among the stars, it was calculated, would pass directly in front of a star. Pass directly in front of a star. And if, so if you're, wa it's just small and it's dark and there's nothing to it. So if you're watching the star's light, you see the star, you see the star, you see the star, you see, now you don't see the star, and now you see the star again. And because you know the orbit of this object, and you, you know how fast it's going in its orbit, the length of time that the star gets blinked out tells you how big the object is. All right? It's an indirect way. It's called an occultation. Well, so a team of astronomers set up a kind of picket fence, if you will, throughout uh, uh, South America to record uh, this occultation of this event in, back in July of last year. And 
five of the telescopes, you can see the, the little uh, places where the lines are interrupted. Five of the telescopes actually saw the star disappear. But they didn't all see the star disappear at the same time. And when you reconstruct those, those tracks, it looks like the object is a very strange shape. Maybe it's even two objects. And so now we think that either this object, which is called MU69, that's its sort of uh, temporary designation until it gets named, maybe it's two things that kind of collided and stuck together. Yeah, right? like uh, two big scoops of ice cream from Gary's, right, that are kind of uh, sticking together. Or maybe it's one big, long, football-shaped object. We don't know. We don't know. We'll know when we get there, because we're going to get there on New Year's Eve, on January 1st, so that's New Year's Day, this coming New Year's Day. It's going to be quite a New Year's Eve party at that control center down in Maryland as they await the results from this flyby. They've even given it, an ultima, they, they've given it a temporary name, Ultima Thule. Right? Ultima Thule. Thule in ancient Greek was like the most distant place. And the Ultima Thule was the most ultimate distant object that New Horizons is going to visit. And so we're all kind of sitting, waiting for the results. I'll probably give this talk again next year, and I'll have pictures of that object. They, Ultima Thule won't be its final name. It's just kind of a nickname that they've given it for now, because people have a hard time remembering 2014 MU69. Right? So we're waiting. We're waiting for New Horizons' next uh, uh, chapter in its, in its long mission. began in 2006. should be a pretty exciting time, and I think that's it. Thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, uh, and now the, my assistants will be passing out the test. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Um, why, uh, since most of the planets are on the same plane, why is Pluto spinning? That's a really good question. So his question is, uh, why is Pluto's orbit tipped? Why is its inclination high and not like all the other planets? In the process of capturing Pluto into this resonance, the Neptune forced Pluto into this 3 to 2 resonance, and it also forced it out of, its, um, out of, out of the plane. When you, when you run the numbers of that capture into a resonance, it gets kicked up into a, into a higher inclination orbit. And it, 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 we didn't know this back when it was discovered, but we've some, since come to realize that that inclination is, is part of the capture process by Neptune. Great question. Great question. Others? Yes, ma'am. Um, you had mentioned about that International Astronomical Society right. has the definition of a planet. Right. Now, do all astronomers um, go by this definition? Right. Do, do different groups have different definitions? Right. So her question is, does the definition that the IAU came up with for Pluto, is that sort of uh, uh, the official one? Or do different groups go by different things? Well, um, there are plenty of us. Did I mention that I think the definition is stupid? Yeah. yeah. Um, in an ideal world, they'd realize what a mistake they made, and they would go back and fix it. So for example, that definition, it defines what a dwarf planet is. And Pluto qualifies as a dwarf planet. Ceres qualifies as a dwarf planet, even though it's in the asteroid belt. But by that definition, dwarf planets are not planets, which doesn't make any sense. In, even in astronomy, we have Did you know that the sun is considered a dwarf star? It's still a star. We know that there are things called dwarf galaxies. A chihuahua is still a dog, right? And so, and so that's one of the problems with this definition, but we are stuck with that. Another real problem with this definition is that it defined what the small end of a planet is, you know, the, in the scale of things, which is actually very hard. At the high end, astronomers have a pretty firm idea of how big something can be, bef at, at which point it stops being a planet and starts being a star. If Jupiter were about 100 times more massive than it is now, Remember, it's got all the, it's mostly composed of yeah. hydrogen and helium, right? But mostly hydrogen. It would start turning the hydrogen into helium. It would create fusion, which is what our sun does in order to create the heat. So we know what that is. It's, it's about, um, um, 
11 times, let's see, what, it's 80 times the mass of Jupiter, right? Is, is the limit at which it would stop being a planet and start being, well, that's not included in the definition either. There's so many, plus they've got these two definitions that are based on mass. Well, guess what? When you discover something around another star, you really don't know how massive is it is. You might be able to figure out how big it is, but you don't know its mass. Uh, it's very, it's a very difficult quantity. to. Is that why they came up with the dwarf planet? Yeah, they so. No, that's exactly, well, they did come up with a definition for a dwarf planet because they needed to call Pluto something, but the definition, by that definition, a dwarf planet is not a kind of planet, which is why, look, I can live with Pluto being a dwarf planet. I can live, it is small, right? It is not that massive, but it should be a type of planet. It makes perfect sense to me. There's a hierarchy. There are major planets, right? The big eight. There are dwarf planets, of which we know three or four. Eris would count, for example. And then there are minor planets, which are the little asteroids. So it all makes sense to me, probably makes sense to you, but not to them. They just didn't, it was kind of a rushed hack job, really. It was, it was cobbled together at the last minute. Why are they stuck? What's that? Why are they stuck? I mean, why can't it change? You would think. It's a, <laughs> I thought. I thought personally, so all right, so that meeting where they made that definition was in 2006. I was convinced that after New Horizons went by and showed us what Pluto's got, it's got a lot. Who knew there would be all that geology? Every, all the scientists are blown away, right? It's got stuff that would qualify it as a planet. It's got seasons. It's got an atmosphere. It's got four moons. That sounds kind of planet-like to me, right? Um, and yet, they, I, I figured at their next meeting, they only meet every three years, I figured they would for sure go back and revisit their definition of what a planet is and tweak it, right, to make it more correct. They haven't done that. There's no indication that they're going to. I, 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 it doesn't make any sense to me. Yes, sir? Yes. Right, they were complete, it was why, just, it, wasn't it calculated, you know, hundreds, years earlier? Yeah, 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 right. So his question is, why was there even a suspicion that, that Pluto existed and was affecting the orbits of Uranus and Neptune? What, couldn't they have gotten the calculations right the first time? It's just math. Right, it's just right, it's right. just math. That's right. The, the problem is that you didn't really know how massive Neptune was. You could guess. So you couldn't do the calculation. You couldn't do the calculation. You had only observed the orbits of Neptune because, you know, they're so far from the sun, it takes uh, Uranus 84 years to circle the sun. It takes Neptune 160-something, and I forget what the something is. Neptune has just barely completed one orbit since its discovery. So you've only observed it for a short period of time, and it's too little time to, like, work out all the, like, decimal points. So it was an approximation. But it, it, given what they had at that time, it seemed like there were what, what are called residuals, leftover bits that aren't explained, that required another planet. And now we know that, that no other planet was required. Other questions? You've got a bunch of good ones here. Thank you. Go ahead. Where will New Horizons go? It's still going to have to, it's, it's still going to continue, right? Right. So his question is, what happens to New Horizons after the flyby with uh, Ultima Thule, right? It's, it's flying out of the solar system so fast that it's going to escape the sun forever and just go out into interstellar space. You might have heard that about six months ago, astronomers captured uh, a, uh, an object passing through the inner solar system that was traveling so fast, it could only have come from outside the solar system. It's called Oumuamua. It's a Hawaiian word. Uh, and it is the first time ever that we have discovered in our solar system an object that came from someplace else, from some other star system. Tens of millions or billions of years ago, we don't know how long it's been going through space. New Horizons will be that kind of object. It will be drifting among the stars. It will leave the solar system and never come back. Never, ever come back. 
like Voyager, right, the Voyager spacecraft and the pioneers before them, Pioneer 10 and 11, they're all leaving the solar system. They have so much velocity, yes, they are gradually slowing down, right, because the sun is pulling on them, but they have, a, they have too much velocity, they are going to escape the solar system forever. Great question. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, it's a one question limit. Here's the fir first half of the question. <laughs> so it's incredibly far away. From Pluto, it takes about four and a half hours for a radio transmission to go. Right, at the speed of light, which is 186,282 miles per second. Right. right. Yeah. right. And a half. And a half. So, and then at this uh, Ultima Thule, um, it's some hours more. So how far away will this thing get? Like when it gets past Ultima? To track it. And then the second part of that is you want? All right. it must take an I mean, it's got to be powered by something, but it's so far from the yes. sun. Yes. Okay. okay. Great. Great. Okay. So I'll take the second one first. All right. uh, sp spacecraft that, so Pluto is um, on average uh, about 40 times farther than the sun than the Earth is. And the intensity of sunlight goes as the square of that. So on average, the sunlight that strikes Pluto is a, a thousand to two thousand times fainter, less intense than here on Earth. You can't run solar cells with that. Most of the spacecraft that go around Earth's orbit or around other planets, the Earth, they use these solar cells, right, to generate electricity. Spacecraft that far out use instead uh, little uh, canisters full of plutonium. And as the plutonium, it's a radioactive element, right? It's in, in a ceramic form. It's not like it's just sitting there. They've encapsulated it. And as it, as it decays, it gives off heat. And you can convert that heat into electricity. And that's what powers it. And so that's what powers the Voyagers and the Pioneers, which are also on their way out of the solar system. So then you have enough power to make it last for a long time after it goes finishes doing what it's doing. The Voyagers did their best work in the 1970s and 80s. How and long can you keep it going? Well, you can keep it going. The, the plutonium has a half-life that's quite long. So you can keep the spacecraft going for many dozens of years. Now, eventually, you start running out of electricity, but there are things you can do, right? You can turn off an experiment, or you can only contact it once a week instead of you know three times a day or something like that. But then the other question is, can you track it? Is the radio transmitter strong enough over those great distances to still have a signal strong enough to rec be received at Earth? And the answer is yes. So what they plan to do with New Horizons, to your first point, is they plan to use it to look at other stars for evidence of planets, right? Not, not so much to try to like see a planet sitting there, but kind of like that occultation technique. So imagine <clears throat> that you're, a, you're looking at a distant star and all you see is a point of light. But in reality, the star is a big ball of gas, mostly consisting of hydrogen. hydrogen. It gets louder each time. We'll eventually get this, right? Now, imagine the planet is spinning in an orbit, just, just oriented in such a way that you can watch it, that the planet appears to go directly in front of and behind the star. Star is big, the planet's small, right? But as it goes in front of the star, it blocks a little bit of the star's surface as seen from our perspective. The total light goes down. We can measure that. And if that happens every, say, two weeks, we know that that's a planet in orbit around that star. I want you to imagine a time when it, when it really will be summer here. <clears throat> and you'll be outside at night, and you've got a porch light, and there's a bunch of bugs flying around it, right? And you're not paying much attention. And all of a sudden, you see in the shadows, you see a little blip in the light. And you look up, and there you can see that there's this big moth flying around the light. Same concept. We call that a transit. And so we can tell just by monitoring the star's light that there are other planets, that there, not, that there are planets around that star. It turns out this is the best way to discover planets. Just last week, just last week, uh, NASA launched a spacecraft called TESS, T-E-S-S. -S. Uh, the science payload is just a bunch of cameras, four cameras, built by MIT, and it's going to study stars near us in space for the, just exactly that. They're going to stare at the stars and see if they can catch planets like zipping in front and to try to discover planets that are small, like the Earth, 
in, around stars that are near enough to us that we have some hope someday of actually studying the planets themselves. So that's what uh, New Horizons is going to do after it finishes with good old Ultima Thule. Right? It's going to be studying stars for these transits to see if we can discover, it can discover, because uh, its camera is very sensitive, can discover planets around them using that technique. Until the power runs out, or the signal gets too weak, you know, or something breaks. So it could be a long time. One of the challenges for a team like this, now, the, the spacecraft was launched in 2006. That was 12 years ago. Prior to that, they had to build the thing. The science team was assembled mm, six to eight years before that. So the scientists involved with this mission have already devoted like 20 years to it. And that's a lot of your professional lifetime, right? You're on the same program for 20 years. And it's exciting every once in a while, right? <laughs> but, mostly but mostly it's sleeping. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's the challenge. So not only do you need the power to keep uh, to keep going, right, to keep operating. You need enough radio signal to get back to Earth. You need something interesting to look at, and you need somebody to sign the checks back home <laughs> to keep the scientists operating. These missions work on what are called extended missions, right? They, they accomplish what they were supposed to do in, say, three years, but they're still going strong. And so the team will go to NASA and say, our spacecraft is still doing a great job. Can we have funding for two more years to keep doing what we've been doing? And it, they, it's a decision. And sometimes, most of the time it's yes, if it's being scientifically productive. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes perfectly productive scientific spacecraft are turned off because there's not enough money to, to you've spent hundreds of million dollars to get it into space, right? That day will come for the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble's replacement, which is called the James Webb Space Telescope, was supposed to be launched this year. It's been postponed, but eventually Hubble, which was launched in, anybody know, gone to guess when Hubble was launched? What year? 1990. 1990. It's already been in space for almost 20 years. Go figure. Seems like only yesterday, right? 20 years it's been in space. There will come a time when Hubble is no longer, it takes a lot to run it, right? And they will turn off the switch. And, and just let it, you know, decay and fall to Earth. Oh, does it continue floating up there? Or? No, eventually Hubble will, Hubble's in a pretty high orbit, so it will stay in orbit probably for hundreds of years, right? Uh, here's a little known fact for you. The first satellite that the United States launched was called Explorer 1, right? That was our response to Sputnik. The second satellite we launched was called Vanguard. Vanguard 1. Vanguard 1, launched in March of 1958, is still in orbit. Explorer 1, not so much. But, but. So, uh, it, and Hubble's in the same situation. It's in a high enough orbit that the atmospheric drag will keep it from being dragged back into the atmosphere, like the Chinese space station a couple weeks ago, for quite some time. So it will, it, it, but eventually, we'll stop funding it. We'll, we'll just leave it up there and say, job well done. Yes, sir. Is it just the momentum that keeps New Horizons moving? Yes. It's, it's a bullet. It's ballistic at this point. It has a little bit of gas to like make small course corrections, but it can't dramatically change its velocity. It's, it was powered by a, uh, an Atlas rocket, uh, and in fact, when it left, it was the fastest object ever launched from Earth. It reached the moon's orbit in something like, I don't know, nine hours, something really incredibly fast. So it's, it, it will just... Keep cruising like a bullet. Yes, sir. When you talked about uh, clearing the neighborhood as part of the definition of being a planet, you said that if Earth were farther out, it right. would not be able to clear its neighborhood. Right. I didn't catch All that. right, you're right. So I kind of went through that fast. Um, as you get farther out, right, the distance between uh, planets becomes greater. So the distance between us and Mars is like, at its closest, maybe 35 million miles. By the way, this coming summer, I mentioned Mars. Mars will be closer to the Earth at the end of July than it's been since 2003, right? It will be, you'll hear about it in the news. You'll remember that Kelly told you about it, right? And there'll be a big deal. Uh, and a lot of people will say, ooh, when can I go out and see Mars? And maybe we'll have a star party here to go watch it. Who knows? Um, but planets in the inner solar system are spaced pretty close together. When you get out to the distance of Uranus and Neptune, uh, Uranus is 
20 astronomical units from the Sun, 20 times the Earth's distance. Saturn, the next planet in, is 10 astronomical units. That's a billion miles, right? So when you get out to those distances, not only are the distances vast, so your neighborhood gets bigger, you also move slower. Everything moves slower. So in the Earth system, if you've got something that's in our, it's in our neighborhood, right? You're going zzz around the sun and eventually you, you meet up with each other and something happens. Out there, everything is in slow motion. And so it takes a much longer time. And even if you put the Earth out there far enough, it would not, be, it's not really in the grand scheme of things, the Earth is not a very massive planet, right? So, so it wouldn't have enough oomph to clear its neighborhood for those reasons. All right, oh, all right, so we'll take two more and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Go ahead. Great question. She, so for our TV audience, she says, Pluto has an atmosphere. I thought it was so cold, right? How can anything still be a gas at that temperature? And that temperature is something like, uh, 50 degrees Kelvin, that's uh, about 80 degrees above absolute zero. It's really cold. And the answer is that, remember I mentioned how Pluto goes through these sort of dynamic swings? Uh, I kind of raced through that part. Also, it has a, a very eccentric orbit, so it can be at times closer to the sun than Neptune. When you get closer, you get a little warmer. When you're tipped over and you, even if you have a patch of ice, this happens here in Boston, too. Remember when we had all that snow? Sometimes the snow disappears, right? E even though it doesn't melt, a snowbank gradually gets smaller. And it might, even, it might be a cold day, but the snowbank is still getting smaller. And that's because the ice can sublimate, can go directly from a gas, uh, from a solid to a gas. And in the case of Pluto, that frozen nitrogen that makes Sputnik planum, so smooth, right? That's what it's covered with a slab of frozen nitrogen. That nitrogen is right at the point at which it can be a gas or frozen. And it only takes a few degrees, one way or the other, to change that. And so ices have, no matter what their temperature, they have something called partial pressure. It's how much of them can become a gas. If you have an ice cube sitting in the middle of your, you know, in the middle of a field, right? At a certain temperature, I can tell you how long it will take that ice cube to disappear, even if it's just sublimating away, because the, the temperature dictates how much of the gas, how much of the, how many of the molecules will escape from being a solid and become a gas. And that's a really technical explanation. I'm really sorry, but the point is that even when it's a frozen slab of nitrogen, a little of it can become a gas, even at those cold temperatures. You make it a little bit warmer, and a lot of it turns into a gas. And that's when Pluto gets such a thick atmosphere that every couple of million years sort of scenario, it can have such a thick atmosphere that not only does the nitrogen convert from frozen to gas, it can also convert from frozen to liquid, <coughs> liquid nitrogen, right? We have liquid nitrogen here on the Earth. And so that's when you start getting the glaciers moving and the puddles on the surface. It, it, uh, we won't be around to see it, but you know, 900,000 years from now, that's what, that's what Pluto will be a much different place. It'll be warmer and warm enough to have this liquid nitrogen on the surface. Ma'am, no? You're just, you're, all right. Well, look, thank you all very much. Um, I really appreciate being here. I appreciate uh, Danny's invitation to come and speak for Science Cafe. This has been great. I understand this is a pretty good crowd for him, and, and I'm grateful that you came. Uh, I have a little secret. Uh, first, you can come up and take a look at, at uh, the Pluto globe, now that you know all about it. That's great. Uh, I brought a telescope. It's in my car, and if you'll give me five minutes out in the parking lot, I will set it up and we'll take some peeks at the moon. Okay? If you want to stick around for that, that would be great. Thank you again, and have a great night. Thank you very much.